Chapter 7 The morning after she'd arrived home, Lily woke to find the snow was falling thick and fast. She put on her winter coat to take a walk in the grounds. Two strange steam wagons were parked in the driveway, one a Rolls-Royce Phantom with a mechanical chauffeur and number plate, Silverfish, the other a small squat vehicle with a black chimney stack barely bigger than a top hat. Neither looked to have anything to do with Papa. Among the distant trees she caught sight of two standing figures. She recognised them at once as Papa's other mechanicals, Mr Wingnut and Miss Tock. Frozen like statues, rakes in their hands and a wheelbarrow at their side, they were gradually being covered in snow. Why on earth were they out there in this weather? And run down too? Surely they'd corrode. She hurried to the back door and tumbled into the kitchen, searching for Mrs Rust. An iron range warmed the room with a scent of freshly baking biscuits, and the mechanical cook hummed softly to herself, clattering about whipping eggs in a bowl with a whisk arm attachment. Her selection of replaceable hands gleamed on their hooks along the dresser, spatulas, sieves, saucepans, spoons and fish slices, each one well used and sparkling. Why are Mr Wingnut and Miss Tock unwound in the garden? You're up early, Miss Rust said, ignoring the question. I didn't sleep very well, so I decided to take a walk. Lily clapped her gloved hands together to banish the cold. Tell me, Mrs Rust looked sad. Madam sent them to clear up leaves yesterday, and when they froze halfway through the job, she refused to wind them, said it wasn't her business to follow round her less mechs, making sure they worked. Following round useless mechs, making sure they worked. She only wound me up to cook, and Captain Springer to take her and collect her from the station. Before that, she had him locked in the cellar. Lily's eyes brimmed with tears. Can't we help them? she asked. I don't think so, dear. The old mechanical shook her head. Madame took all our winding keys as soon as your papa was gone. It's only been a day. He could still come back, make things better, couldn't he? Her head ached from thinking about it. Perhaps that's our job. Mrs Rust took a wheezing breath. I know sometimes life can be painful, my tiger. But remember, if you can't change what's happened today, you must bide your time. Uh, until you're strong enough to fight tomorrow. She set her bowl aside and held out a rack of biscuits. Here, have an almond thin. I make them special, to put warmth in your belly. Thank you. Lily took one in her gloved hands and bit into it. The big biscuit tasted delicious, but... Oh, it was hot! She sucked air in through her teeth, waving a hand in front of her face. Steam and steel! I didn't realise they were still piping. Comes of having heat-proof fingers. But give it time, my dear, and the hurt will fade. I'd say the same to you about Papa. If he'd let me. She set the rack of biscuits aside. We best save the rest of these for after breakfast. Yes, Lily said, we best. She slumped in a chair by the fire and put her feet on the fender, warming her boots. She tried not to dwell on the fates of the other mechs, or Malkin, or Papa. It was hard not to do. But something about this room made her feel safe from the bad in the world. Perhaps it was Mrs Rust herself. She was so warm-hearted and understood everything Lily was going through, not like Madame. If you had to guess which of the two had feelings, Lily knew who she'd choose. Mrs Rust swapped her whisk hand for a spatula from the dresser, clicking it into place. Stopwatches and spinning tops! I plum clean forgot! Madame Verdigree wants to see you in the drawing room straight away after breakfast! Lily gulped. It was as if she'd been summoned just for thinking ill of Madame. I wonder what she wants. Mrs Russ gave a jittery shrug. By all that ticks, I've no idea. She's got some lawyer and another fellow with her. I think it's disgusting. Your father's barely been missing a day. The way she carries on, you'd suppose they'd already knew he was dead rather than... She tailed off. Steam engines and stovepipes, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. That's okay, Rusty. Lily picked at a fingernail and took a breath, holding in another sharp wave of sorrow. Why didn't you tell me? So why don't you tell me what else has been going on? The old mechanical took the kettle from the stove and poured a spurt of water into the pot to warm it. I'm all zeros and ones today, she lamented, spooning in the tea before filling the pot to the brim with water. Since Madame's been in charge, she's been snuffling in everyone's business. Thinks your father had valuables hidden in the house. Mrs Rust laid some tea cakes on the stove top, pressing them down with her spatula hand. Even interviewed Captain Springer, Miss Tock, 
and Mr Ringnut yesterday morning. I could have told her they don't know anything. That's why she's let them wind down. But you do know something, Lily said. Cam springs and cold cream, I couldn't rightly say. Mrs Rust gave her a darting nervous look as she scraped up the tea cakes and buttered the browned underside of each. There were so many things your father was working on, but I doubt any of them was valuable enough in to be disappeared for. She placed the plate of tea cakes in front of Lily. Eat up, my tiger. You don't want to face her upstairs on an empty stomach. Lily took off the marmalade jar and spooned some onto the warm bread. She felt lucky to be so doted on, considering the way everyone else here had been treated. If Papa was around, he put a stop to it. But he wasn't, and it seemed his secrets were the reason everything had gone wrong in the first place. When she arrived in the drawing room half an hour later, Lily found Madame already present, along with her with Mr Sunder, a grey lawyer from the firm Renton Sunder. Also present was a barrel of a man who perched on the edge of his chair with his hat on his knees. His handsome, square-jawed face looked thinner and more lined than when she had last seen it, but it lit up immediately at the sight of her. Lily, he cried, there you are. Professor Silverfish, Lily broke into a broad smile. Yes, it's me. Her godfather stood and gave her an enormous bear hug. You've grown so tall. Have you still got those tin toys I bought you? She shook her head. They broke, I'm afraid. How? I took them apart to see how they worked. Professor Silverfish laughed. <laughs> a girl after my own heart. He drew back and winced, and Lily heard a ticking coming from his chest. Speaking of hearts, the professor said, I'm afraid I've been most unwell, Lily. Carefully, he undid the buttons of his jacket, revealing a lumpy metal device buckled on over his shirt. Tubes from the device ran in and out of his chest. It's all right, he reassured her when he saw her look of horror. It's perfectly harmless, a clockwork prototype, a hybrid heart, nothing more. It keeps me from going completely kaput. Professor Silverfish ran a hand through his spray of white hair. Of course, it takes a lot of winding, like one of the mechanicals. What? And it means in many ways I'm invalided. I cannot function as I used to. But still, I try my best, and I've come to see you, Lily, in your hour of need. Papa never told me you were ill. I just thought you'd gone away. Professor Silverfish's face fell. Yes, I missed your father in recent years, missed everyone, but I had to visit warmer climes... For my health, for this, he tapped the contraption on his chest. I only wish I could have been here for you with everything that's happened. Your mother's death and now John's disappearance. I hear you've been taken out of school. Lily took a deep breath. She was glad he'd stopped talking. The things he was saying and the horrible device only made her feel worse. Professor Silverfish seemed to sense her discomfort. I'm sorry. And he buttoned his jacket, muffling the loud tick of the device and took a deep breath before sitting back with a wince. Madame Verdigree, who had been conversing quietly with Mr. Sunder, gave a discreet cough. Bien, she said, if we might get the proceedings underway. Of course, Professor Silverfish nodded. Lily, why don't you take a seat? Lily sunk into Papa's old leather armchair in the centre of the room and watched Mr. Sunder sit down opposite her on the sofa. He produced a sheaf of documents from a folder in his lap and, shuffling them together, placed them on the table in front of him. Miss Artman, since your father went missing yesterday, certain protocols have been taken into consideration. He did leave a letter with us concerning your welfare. If anything was to happen to him, I am going to read it to you. Now, Mr. Sunder took out a pair of pince nez and polished them with a spotted handkerchief. Lily waited for the worst, but only the soft tick of Professor Silverfish's heart machine and Madame's shallow, steady breathing filled the silence. Finally, Mr. Sunder per perched his spectacles on his beaky nose and began to read. I, John Hartman, being of sound mind and body... Do hereby set down my wishes regarding the future care of my daughter, Lily Grace Hartman. His cold words echoing round the room sounded most unlike Papa. Lily glanced tearfully at the professor and then at Madame Verdigree, lingering in the bay window, her hawk-like profile. 
Buck as a cameo was framed by the lines of the sash. Madame turned and spoke impatiently to the lawyer. We know this. Skip to the important part. Perhaps the young lady would like to. I said skip to the details. Right. Mr. Sunder gave an embarrassed cough. The terms. All patents, devices and properties are to be held in trust for Lily, who will come into ownership on her 18th birthday. Mr. Hartman has stipulated that until then, Madame Verdigree is to be appointed guardian and a trustee of the patents to be informally advised by myself and the girl's godfather. He nodded to Professor Silverfish. What about Mrs. Rust? Lily asked. I thought Papa would have appointed her my guardian. Lily is right, Professor Silverfish, Silverfish said. And what are of the other mechanicals who work for John? Captain Springer, Miss Tock, and Mr. Wingnut. He must have made some provision for them also. Mr. Sunder shuffled through the few short pages, his lips moving as he read the words. Finally, he turned them over as if he expected to find something on their blank side. I am afraid not, sir, miss. Beneath his spectacles, his eyes darted nervously to Madame. It would seem there are no clauses relating to McAnimals in this document. Professor Silverfish leaned forward in his chair. Do you not think that odd, sir? Not in my experience, Mr. Sunder replied. Well, said Professor Silverfish, I do. I do too, Lily said. Papa loved his mechanicals as, as much as he loved me and Mama. They're practically a part of our family, Mrs Rust especially. After Mama, she was the one who took care of me. I would have expected him at least to have thought about her. When death is preying on their mind, people do not always behave as they did in life, Miss Hartman, the lawyer said. Lily's heart kicked in her chest. Then you do think my papa is dead? Mm, not at all, Mr. Sunder gulped. I'm merely hypothesising. I mean, until he's found, or until he's pronounced, uh, that's to say. He shuffled his papers in his hands nervously. Anyway, Miss Hartman, if you know or knew anything about legal matters, and uh, being an enfant, Madame cut in. We wouldn't expect you to. Yes, quite. Then you'd, you'd know mechanicals don't have the same rights as we humans do. He looked at Madame once more for help. For, for example, mechanicals are not allowed to uh, own things or be in charge of a steam vehicle or an airship or indeed a child. Things a responsible adult might undertake are forbidden to them on the grounds they lack intelligence, selfhood, etc., etc. Which is why your father picked me as your guardian, Madame Verdigree added. Is this true? Lily asked the professor. Uh, I am afraid so, he said. I never considered the legal side of things. Bien, enough of this. Madame placed her hands on the headrest of Lily's chair. Let Mr. Sunder finish. He's a very busy man. Mr. Sunder, tell Lily about the other matter we discussed. Yes, sir, uh, ma'am, but it's rather delicate if I might speak to the adults alone first. Lily gave a pleading look to the professor. I think, he said, if it relates to Lily's rights, she should be present. We must respect... D'accord! The housekeeper cut him off. You may speak in front of the child, Mr. Sunder. I suppose the professor is right. There should be no secrets between us. She grasped Lily's shoulder and gave it a painful squeeze. Uh, as you wish, Mr. Sunder smoothed a tuft of greasy hair atop his head, playing for time. Ladies, Professor Silverfish, thanks to Professor Hartman's projects, the estate has accrued considerable debts over the years, more than his patents and holdings are worth. What do you mean exactly? Professor Silverfish asked. I'm, I mean, the money is insufficient to pay either for Lily's keep or to stay in this house. You see, Madame said to Lily, it is as I feared. 
Professor Silver shook his head. I don't understand. None of this seems possible. Surely John would have sold his patents. If things were so bad, he'd have done everything in his power to make sure Lily was provided for. Perhaps it was less circumspect than you imagined, sir. Mr. Sunder took his glasses from his nose and polished them again vigorously with his handkerchief. What would you advise us to do? Madame asked. Mr. Sunder glanced between Lily and Madame, his gaze lingering on Madame. My advice to you, Miss Hartman, to your guardian, is to sell everything of value, mechanicals, devices, and then possibly even the building itself. You can't, Lily said. They're Papa's things, our things. It seems we have no choice, Madame Verdigree told her grimly. Lily couldn't believe it. There was always a choice, wasn't there? Isn't that what people said, if only she could persuade them? But then she saw the professor's resigned expression and the lawyer's solemn face. She turned and caught the brief smug smile on Madame's lips and was shocked to realise that this horrible woman was now in charge of her life. Afterwards, while Madame showed Mr Sunder to the door, Lily took Professor Silverfish aside. Please don't leave me alone with her, she begged. The professor's face dropped. I'm sorry, Lily. There's nothing I can do. It's it's your father's decree, and for the moment I don't think it would be wise to go against it, despite the fact I don't feel Madame Verdigree is entirely trustworthy. Lily shook her head. She isn't. Mrs. Russ told me things about her, how she deliberately ran down the mechanicals yesterday, and she's gone through Papa's papers while he's been away. Really? Professor Silverfish looked shocked. Well, that doesn't sound like something she should be doing. No! Lily agreed. She took the professor's coat down from the hat stand and helped him as he wheezily struggled into it. Then she buttoned the front closed over his bulky mechanical heart. Professor Silverfish put on his top hat, tapping the rim until it sat comfortably on his head. If you like, he said finally, I can arrange to have John's things stored at the Mechanist Guild. I'm sure it's something he would have wanted to help other researchers making new mach machines. But only if you're happy with such a decision, Lily. I'm happy with it, Lily said. They reached the front door and she stared at Madame's poker straight back. The woman was standing on the driveway, waving to the lawyer as he putted away in his little grey steam wagon. Good, the professor ruffled Lily's hair and stepped out into the cold. I want you to do one more thing for me. I want you to keep an eye on your guardian and report back on her movements. He took a card from his pocket and placed it in Lily's hand, closing her fingers around it. With compliments of Professor Silverfish, makers of first-class mechanicals and mechanimals. Nine, Riverside Walk, Chelsea. This is my new London address. You can write or telegraph any time to tell me how you're getting on. And if there's anything else, anything you need, he gave an embarrassed cough. I'm so sorry we've been out of touch for so long, Lily. I'd only recently returned to England when I heard the terrible news, and I felt it was imperative I come visit you. I'm very glad you did. She gave him one more hug. I do wish you and Papa hadn't lost contact. Well, it was understandable, really. Towards the end of his time in London, we, we had a falling out. About what? Oh, the business, mostly, and because I was sick, I missed your mother's funeral, for which I don't think he ever forgave me. Professor Silverfish gave a start when he saw Madame Verdigree approaching up the steps of the porch. But now is no time to talk about that. Next time you're in London, you must visit me and I'll tell you about it. He folded his arms over the ticking machine on his chest. Right, I'm afraid I have to go. There are things I need to do for my health. I do hope they find your father, Lily. If you need advice or you have any further trouble with her, he nodded at Madame, then you must contact me right away. Thank you, I shall. And I shall keep this safe. Lily slipped the card into her pocket. See you do. The professor bent down and kissed her on the top of her head before striding away from the manor. As he passed Madame, he didn't even tip his hat. What was all that about? She asked. But Lily brushed her aside and ran to the edge of the porch. She watched her godfather get into his Rolls Royce Phantom steam wagon. Her last hope was leaving without her. When he was seated comfortably, the professor looked back and gave her a brief wave goodbye. Then he signalled to his mechanical chauffeur and they drove off down the drive, making tracks 
in the deepening snow.